Good evening. I welcome you all. Um, tonight, my name is Kathleen Lewis, and I'm, I'm curator of spacesuits and international space programs here at the Air and Space Museum. And I'm welcoming you to the program tonight, Apollo, um, Spacesuits Apollo to Today. Um, we would like to thank tonight um, for support of the museum's Apollo 50th programs. Um, it's being generously supported by Boeing with additional support from the Raytheon. This video in particular has resonance for the program tonight that celebrates the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. We have assembled a panel of speakers, are really fantastic, some of my favorite people I like to talk to when talking about spacesuits, to recount the making of the Apollo spacesuits and to for inform us on the lessons that we have learned as we are going back to the next spacesuit, in the next thing in spacesuit development, be it going back to the moon, going to an asteroid, or going on to Mars. In order to save time for tonight's program, I'm going to introduce all four speakers, and they're going to come up sequentially um, and tell their stories, and then we'll have time for discussion and questions from the audience at the end. Our speakers tonight, in order of appearance, are first, Bill Airy, who's a recently retired test engineer at ILC Dover, the company that made the Apollo spacesuits and makes the current spacesuits that uh, astronauts use to spacewalk from the ISS when they leave via the American port on the International Space Station. Um, the next speaker for tonight will be Ryan Nagata, who is an artist and maker from California who did a sort of unique approach to becoming a maker and a model maker. He started out as a film director and discovered that he, his real passion was making models, props, and costumes for hire that are featured in many movies. Um, Ryan will talk about his experience of recreating some of the vintage suits that were used in the movie First Man, the biopic about Neil Armstrong. Our third speaker for tonight is Nick Moiseyev. He was a Russian lead des spacesuit designer at the company Zvezda in the USSR in Russia. Um, and he is, um, has come to this country and uh, participated in spacesuit glove designs and won the competition on the spacesuit glove design. He now has a company of his own based in Brooklyn. And he is going to talk about his perspective on spacesuits in light of his career as a Russian spacesuit designer and engineer and an American spacesuit entrepreneur. Our last speaker for the evening will be Dr. David Newman, who is the Apollo Professor of Astronautics and Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And she's one of the few people I can say has a better job title than I do. Um, really amazing. Um, and Dr. Newman will talk about the next generation of responsive materials for spacesuits to make these form-fitting spacecraft truly a perfect fit for exploration. So I'm going to call on our first speaker, Bill Airy, to talk about the Apollo legacy of spacesuits. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Kathy. And it's uh, quite an honor to be invited uh, to join this panel tonight. It's uh, quite an illustrious panel. And I thank you all for coming tonight. Um, so let's uh, start with the slide presentation. I have like you know, five minutes to cover 40, 50 years of history of Apollo, so I'm going to make this pretty fast. And I try to do it as best I can. I start from the humble beginnings. This is our um, very early ILC spacesuit developed by a Mr. Len Shepard, who was our engineer. Uh, developing suits at the time. And he saw a need for, to support the future vision of humans working in outer space. Um, you know, Len Shepard was an ILC working, uh, engineer working on the K1 and K, uh, MA2 helmets. And you see one of those helmets there in, in the photo. They were used by the Air Force for high altitude suits. And he pondered how the helmets were being used by the Air Force at the time. And he realized that the future of humans in space was not far off. But he could see that the, there was only B.F. Goodrich and David Clark with their high-altitude flight suits, but there was no true spacesuits out there. 
Of course, this was early. We're talking in the 1950s. But we knew that eventually humans were going to fly into space. So he proposed to company NRA and Spinel that they provide funding for developing such a suit. This funding would be split ultimately uh, about 50-50 between ILC and the Air Force through most of the 1950s and early 1960s. And by 1956, I just wanted to say that George Durney uh, was hired and a few others to help carry that, that torch to, to the next level. And I mentioned George because he was, quite, um, an entre he was quite an inventor who helped carry this suit to the next level and bring it to the Apollo suit that it ended up being. So in, uh, the next slide here, this is our uh, first entry into the Apollo contract. So through the 50s and early 60s, we get these Air Force contracts and develop this suit. It wins the first spacesuit contest for Project Apollo. I believe there were seven uh, companies at the time, and many of them didn't really have a suit. They had a design. They had ideas on paper, but we were one of the few that had a true suit. Uh, B.F. Goodrich and David Clark also had a suit. But as fate would have it, we were teamed as a subcontractor Ham to Hamilton Standard. Um, Len and the others at ILC had to have been thrilled when Kennedy announced the goal of landing man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth by the end of the decade. They felt that they had the solution, but unfortunately for them, NASA correctly recognized that this small division of the Playtex Corporation, which is what we were, had little to offer in the way of systems engineering, configuration management, and quality reliability. Thus, they teamed us with Hamilton Standard, who was an aerospace company. It was probably the right decision, given all the, uh, uh, the thought that went into it, because again, we didn't have the rigor. We had very good engineers that could build a one-off suit such as this, but to have the uh, rigor that, that NASA was looking for, it, it just uh, wasn't going to happen uh, the way we were set up at the time. So the early ILC uh, suits, now this is a period between 1962 as we were working with, uh, as a subcontractor between 62 and 65. And these early suits had a long way to go, but the basic design was taking shape. So if you can imagine how comfortable it might have been working in that suit, <laughs> Not very. Um, so, you know, the suit, although if you look at it, you'll see these uh, rubber convolutes. The one thing that our company had the, an edge on was we were latex dipping company, so we could make convolutes that were better than the competitions. And so the knees and the uh, shoulders and the elbows had very good mobility. But when you, you tried to put this big helmet on it, it increased the size of the, the, the bulk of the, the torso section across the shoulders. And it just really made for a very bulky suit. But again, this was the early stages of Apollo. It wasn't something that was going to happen overnight. And that's the way anything happens, right? You design rockets. You design all the hardware that goes with it. You have some failures, and you have to explore along the way. And that's what was happening. So uh, second contract bid. So, um, so here uh, we have um, the second round, because what happened was, um, the basic concept was decent for its time, as I said, in those early suits. But due to the conflicts between ILC and Hamilton management, ILC's position was that Hamilton tried to follow strict guidelines set forth by the aircraft industry that resulted in designs not fit for a spacesuit necessarily, and testing that never seemed to end. Our company president at the time, Mr. Homer Reen, just told me a story the other day about the fact that they would design something, and Hamilton would want to test it and test it and test it. And it, it wasn't, you have to test, trust me. I'm the guy that tests things. But, but there's a point where you call it quits. And he didn't know, the, Hamilton didn't know when to call it quits. That was part of the, the problem. Um, and there was also a move on the part of Hamilton to take the helmet business away from ILC. Those early helmets were bulky. They, weren't, they were state of the art at the time, but definitely not something you'd want to wear for a long duration mission. But Hamilton pursued that. They thought that that helmet idea was OK. So they took the helmet business away from us in order to free up our engineers. And you know, we didn't see it that way because we were making some money off of it. So hey, you're going to take this, take this business away. So that didn't sit well. Finally, in February of 1965, Hamilton announced to NASA that they would be dropping ILC from the team. And they would be working with BF Goodrich on future suit designs. They had already started BF Goodrich uh, in helping them uh, design some different joints. NASA now decides to open the contract back up because they were a little nervous and have a contest to decide who the winner would be. Now, at this point, keep in mind, uh, Gemini suits uh, by David Clark were having some success. They, they had a couple EVAs. They, they, had, they had some problems. They had serious problems with overheating and mobility. But they had a groundwork. They had something that was flying anyway. So in NASA's mind, they probably thought, well, you know, hey, maybe David Clark would be the suit to go to. But Hamilton teamed with B.F. Goodrich. And they thought, OK, B.F. Goodrich, Hamilton, and David Clark will uh, see, have a contest to run off and see what would happen. So ILC, our management went to, Hamilton, or to NASA and protested, saying, you know, we really got a short end of the deal here when you forced us to team. 
with Hamilton, but we understand it, but we want a second shot at it. So NASA agreed. They, they learned their lesson on that, and they said, well, okay, but you have six weeks to put this suit in. So for six weeks, around the clock, because we only had a handful of people, we had a few engineers, some sewers, seamstresses to put these suits together, and they busted their neck in the six weeks they produced this suit right here that you see. And um, it turned out to be the winning suit. Uh, the other two suits didn't have the very good mobility. There were a lot of issues. And even our suit had some issues, but it was issue, they were issues that we knew could be fixed. Uh, you, again, when you design something new, you, you start from, with something and you develop it. So that's, but you can see the, this, the, this suit was a lot more form-fitting. It was tailored. It was the suit we wanted from the very beginning without the Hamilton engineers telling us how to build it. So it ended up being the A7L uh, lunar suit used for Apollo 7 through Apollo 14 missions. It started out as the AX5L suit, which is what you saw previously, and we, we eventually made this A7L suit. Um, it, it did an outstanding job given state-of-the-art technology at its time. It had uh, poor waste mobility, though, uh, because uh, when they were getting in the command modules, they had a strap they had to pull to kind of pull the waist together, and, and it just had, the arms were not very good uh, when we started out with this A7L suit. It was, there were a lot of problems with it. Um, and then we get to the Model A7LB suit. Uh, in 1968, before we were flying, uh, before we flew Apollo 11, we had our engineers go down to Houston on September uh, 20th of 1968 and present this Model A7L suit. At the time, we called it the Omega suit. And it provided increased mobility. As you can see that side view of the suit, there's a zipper you see. It comes down from the chest and it goes across the back. It was a zipper that was a spiral round, wound zipper and it held it airtight in the suit. It freed up the whole waist section so we could get mobility in, in the waist joint and that allowed the astronauts to sit in the, ro uh, the rovers and it provided a lot more mobility. We also had a new arm design that NASA really liked. Uh, so that, that really uh, did, a, did, did a justice. Um, it was first presented in NASA in September 68, as I said. Um, they, they were desperately looking for it because they, they, at the time they were looking for the hard suits. NASA was looking for maybe the Litton suit and uh, they were looking for a suit that could be used in the later Apollo missions and they were going to really, they wondered if they wanted to give us any more work and maybe end up uh, putting money into the, uh, the Litton suits. Uh, they may, but they liked this suit so they immediately asked ILC to certify this arm design so that the first lunar crew for Apollo 11 could have these arms. ILC expedited the certification process, and in late April of 1969, we began work to remove the arms in both Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin's prime suits and replace them with the new arm configuration. This was all accomplished by the first week of June 69, just a few weeks prior to the Apollo 11 mission. So we would constantly get suits back after training or, or uh, runs for fit checks, and we'd have to put new zippers in them, but this was quite a turnaround to take the the, the prime suits for these missions and rip the arms off and put new arms on with the new design that we just certified weeks before. So you could see what our, our troops were going through at the time quite a bit. Um, in 1976, our company had downsized by that time to like 25 people uh, because we put all our eggs in one basket. We didn't have anything left in, in us. We ran out of gas. There was no other contracts uh, for Apollo. Uh, so uh, we were down to 25 people. We knew if we held on, we could win the, the shuttle contract. And we did, uh, and we knew at the time, again, that we didn't have the resources to do this on our own. So at that point, Hamilton came to us, or we came to them. I don't know all the specific details, but it was agreed. Hamilton said, look, you guys definitely establish yourself as the spacesuit providers for NASA, and we think that um, we should team up, and we will not tell you how to build a spacesuit. We'll be out of the spacesuit business, but we'll be the prime contract providing the primary life support system and do the management, the you know, your configuration management, systems engineering, all that, and support you. And, and we just figured at the time with 25 people left, there was no, you know, that was about our only choice. So we said, yes, let's do it. So we teamed up and we ended up uh, winning that contract, which we've had, and it's, of course, it's the uh, International Space Station suit now. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on this, um, but, you know, our history, and it's constantly evolving. We had 21 different suit designs over these years more than 280 suits. I was talking to a couple of the engineers the other day, and we're probably a little over that, but it's just a roll of dice. It's hard to keep track of all the different suits, designs, and numbers, uh, but that's a rough number. Uh, we built it for NASA. We have the, uh, uh, the uh, suit that Alan Eustace wore in the space uh, dive, the, uh, uh, com the, the jump he made from 25 miles up. That's over at the Udvar-Hazy Center. We built that suit for Alan Eustace, and, uh, 
And no loss of life or any mishaps uh, due to any spacesuit assembly. We had minor things happen, but nothing that's sh uh, caused a mission, any issues uh, on the moon for sure. Um, and uh, that provided like 440 EVAs and 3,100 uh, total EVA hours. There were some issues with some suits with the primary life support system, but it wasn't the, uh, wasn't the suit. So uh, I'll just throw that in. Um, so future suit development. So ILC, we have a, a Houston office, and from our lead in Houston there, we're uh, developing next generation IVA and EVA suits. Uh, focuses on light, lightweight design, less hardware, uh, reconfigurable to fit more diverse group of astronauts, so it'll be like a soft upper torso. It's, uh, it, can, it can be reconfigured in sizes. The EVA suits designed for zero G or planetary use, so we can have a lower torso that, that could uh, be used for extravehicular activity in, in uh, zero G or put a lower torso on that same uh, soft upper torso that could have a, uh, planetary use. So you're going to have more lower torso mobility, good knee, ankle flex, and good uh, fitting boots, things of that nature. Both IVA and EVA suits are scheduled for complete, to complete design verification testing by the end of 2019. I think one of our engineers, uh, I talked to Dave uh, Graziosi today, and I think he said the IVA suit was completed, the uh, design, design verification test uh, this week. So um, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to turn this over to my good friend, Ryan Nagata. Thank you, Bill. Uh, oh, do I click this? Oh, there we go. Sorry. Okay, hi. I'm, uh, I'm Ryan Nagata. I'm an artist and maker in Los Angeles. I'm probably best known these days for making extremely accurate replicas of spacesuits. Um, the suits you see in this photo aren't real. They're replicas that I made for a photo shoot. There are no photos of both astronauts on the moon, so... This is not real. And just to prove it, uh, that's another one from the same photo shoot, which is, uh, that also never happened on the moon. Um, I make all these uh, spacesuits in my studio in Los Angeles. Uh, this is an A7LB model suit that I made for a client a few years ago. Um, I fabricate everything for these suits from scratch. Uh, silk screen the patches and pattern out the fabric pieces. I machine the metal fittings for them. Um, I even cast replica neoprene convolutes for the suits, not to hold any pressure because they're just costumes, but to just make sure the suits are kind of the right shape. Um, as you can imagine, it's uh, taken a tremendous amount of research to make these suits as accurate as possible. Uh, in the years I've been doing this, I've been fortunate enough to uh, get to measure some real components. That's a a7LB cover layer that I got to measure. There's a familiar face there. I was doing some research at ILC just a few months ago, actually. Um, the pieces I make are, are almost indistinguishable from the real thing. Um, this is an Apollo bubble helmet I've made recently. It's blown polycarbonate, just like the real thing. Uh, the ring is anodized aluminum, and I even sourced actual beta cloth for that back pad. Um, so it's almost a, almost a real helmet. Um, I guess the real question is, why do I do all this stuff? <laughs> um, I used to work in Hollywood as a director, uh, but I would always make a lot of props and costumes for uh, you know, films and TV shows uh, on the side. And, uh, but I've always been very uh, interested in the space program, particularly spacesuits. Um, and so about five years ago, I decided I wanted to make a really accurate Apollo suit. And uh, this gentleman here happened to see it. This is uh, Adam Savage from Mythbusters. Uh, he's been a big uh, champion of my work. Uh, but he commissioned me to make him an Apollo suit that he wore in an episode of the show. Uh, and, and ever since then, uh, I've just had lots and lots of requests to make uh, replica suits. Um, for private collectors and museums and, and also movies. Um, this is Alan Bean, uh, Apollo 12 astronaut, who was wearing a replica that I made. Uh, and he said it was the most accurate replica of an Apollo suit that he had ever seen, uh, which was high praise from him, because Alan was a, also a great artist and always looking at uh, the forms and proportions of things. So I thought that was 
very nice of him to say. Uh, that's a mini Apollo suit <laughs> I made for my daughter a few years ago. Um, I don't just make Apollo suits either. This is a replica of Wiley Post's pressure suit from 1934. Um, this was the first uh, pressure suit. Uh, and uh, I made this for the Stafford Air and Space Museum. Um, that's actually also a photograph I staged. That's me in that suit. The real suit is was on display here, and I'm told it will be there again. This is a Mercury suit I did for a film. Uh, it's a Gemini suit that I made. Um, sometimes I mask to do stuff from science fiction. This was William Shatner's actual spacesuit costume from uh, an episode of Star Trek, the Tholian Web. Um, but the helmet was missing. Uh, so they used that, the, the costume helmet on an episode of Mork and Mindy, and they never saw it again. <laughs> so the, uh, they, this is the real suit, but it was missing the helmet, so I fabricated all of that just from uh, just watching the sh stills of the show and everything and doing a lot of research. So. That's kind of an interesting little thing. That's um, Alan Eustace, who Bill mentioned. Um, he donated the pressure suit that he wore to this museum, uh, but he wanted a replica of it. Uh, so he asked me if I could do one. Uh, so uh, I made this. Uh, it, it has a lot of the real components on it, so I can't take credit for the whole thing. But um, So I, I guess the reason I'm probably here is because of um, this suit. This is a replica of uh, the X-15 pressure suit. Uh, the real one is on the left there. Uh, and I made this for the Neil Armstrong biopic First Man uh, last year. This is the costume that Ryan Gosling wore when they are uh, recreating one of Armstrong's flights. Uh, I was also a, I made a number of other things for that film, but I was also a suit consultant and uh, helped with a lot of things. Uh, just because of all the research I've done, I get called to advise on these sorts of things. Um, so I did a tremendous amount of research for that suit. Um, this is Joe Engel, who uh, is the last living pilot of the X-15 program. He was a, a technical consultant on the film. Um, and he just absolutely loved the suit. He said, I got it completely right. Um, and uh, he, he also said this was the, his favorite suit that he ever wore. If you know Joe Engel, he, he trained for Apollo, so he wore Apollo suits. He flew on the shuttle. He, he's, he's worn a lot of pressure suits. And he, he kind of had a, an emotional moment looking at that suit again. So it's just those kind of moments that have um, made this line of work that I'm in now really very rewarding. So um, anyway, that's it for my intro. So I would like now to intro introduce Nikolai Moisiev. Hi all, um, thank you for coming. <laughs> I'm Nikolai Moiseev, so originally I'm from Russia. Now I am work in Final Frontier Design, lead designer and chief engineer, Brooklyn, New York. So uh, we found company in 2010 after uh, getting cash prize for astronaut glove uh, competition, uh, two people found Final Frontier Design, Ted Southern and Nikolai Moiseev. <clears throat> so my background, I am spacesuit designer. So I uh, work on uh, spacesuit design all my life. And uh, I'm only man in the world that tested uh, all Russian and a lot of American spacesuits. So on the picture, a color picture that uh, I am on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> that Mars Yard and Johnson Space Center. And uh, I tested that suit in 2001. I have four uh, patterns in uh, space suit design and technology. So I got a green card as a standing scientist in 2013, and uh, last year I got uh, American citizenship. <clears throat> so my business partner, Ted Southern, has uh, outstanding performance in uh, costuming and uh, fashion design, 
and we created a, a company and we have new quality for spiritual design. <coughs> so we have uh, uh, some list of um, NASA awards and we make real space suits. And the uh, uh, last uh, contract in this year, in 2019, uh, we awarded for moon spacesuit boots design. So that uh, elbow shoulder assembly in 2013, and uh, our elbow joints outperform extra vehicle mobility unit uh, bending torques uh, more than two times. So we built a spacesuit gloves for Mars in 2015. So we have outstanding mobility for that glove, uh, knuckle joints or metacarpal joints, and uh, unique uh, some metacarpal joints with uh, abduction abduction. And uh, our thermal micrometeoroid garment has um, uh, advanced thermal insulation uh, from the best thermal insulation in the world made in Glen Research Center. <coughs> Flexible and very, very effective. <coughs> so we have unique um, mechanical counter pressure design for glove and arm assembly. And uh, six NASA test subjects tested uh, that uh, glove in our studio during six hours. And uh, that's uh, very promising technology for the future sp space exploration. So we have a team and a lot of interns in Brooklyn, New York City. And uh, we have a unique uh, service. We provide space use experience. And uh, since 2014, 450 people tested our space use. And NASA really loves that. <coughs> so we have a um, space use uh, low profile fitted for the gliders and uh, any small aircraft for high altitude record attempts. So our commercial IVA or intravehicular activity spacesuit has very low weight, uh, high um, mobility. Um, our spacesuit is only self-joining, self-joining spacesuit in American soil and uh, high adjustability. And uh, that suit on the picture has 13 inches in high and in height uh, adjustments range. So in uh, 2017, NASA awarded us flight opportunity uh, suit, and uh, we tested in zero gravity. Uh, that suit tested um, during four days, 120 parabolas, and zero gravity conditions. <coughs> so. Our spacesuit tested um, in a vacuum chambers and uh, high fidelity flight simulators, and um, we passed oxygen testing with NASA. NASA support us, and uh, um, with the Space Act agreement for uh, certification our species for orbital space flights. So interesting testing in 2018, five people, four men, one woman, during a few days testing in wind tunnel for skydiving. That's a very promising market for high altitude jumps. <coughs> Uh, war aggress in April 2019, it was uh, second class in Connecticut, uh, Groton um, survival systems, and together with integrated space flight company. So <coughs> that's, um, we tested our species from 
uh, escape from Orion capsule mock-up to water. So we are working on uh, extravehicular activities, P2 prototype, and um, we have um, uh, the plan to, to, to do the same uh, business model like for IVA species or intervehicular activity. That um, uh, the first class will be in October in Canadian Space Agency. And uh, we are going to um, make a lot of testing with that suit. So that's uh, not a real species, that's um, uh, only a prototype. So my, my species design on the International Space Station, but um, the first commercial uh, EVA species has a long way to do that. So thank you for your attention. I would love to invite David Newman, Professor MIT. How's everyone doing? What a great evening. I'm thrilled to be here, Bill, Ryan, Nikolai, Kathy. This is a, an amazing national brain trust of a spacesuit uh, knowledge and design and history lesson, I think, for, for all of us. So it's my uh, great pleasure to be here with all of you. And I'll uh, dare to take us into the future a little bit. So spacesuit is um, the world's smallest spacecraft. A spacesuit equals spacecraft, all right? Uh, these are my Apollo bloopers. And the reason I like to show these uh, is because we're going back to the moon. We've been there, and we had this amazing suit. Can you imagine that? 50 years ago, and I, I do have the uh, honor to be the Apollo program professor at MIT. And, uh, but I've been waiting 50 years, so we have to get back there. Now, we're going there to do a lot of science uh, this time. Again, world's smallest spacecraft shrunk around a person. So it is necessarily kind of heavy. It's not very mobile. It's actually hard to do your science. In the middle, we've talked about it. That's the extravehicular mobility suit. That's the current NASA suit. It flew on the shuttle, and it's flown uh, for 19 years now on International Space Station because we had to build Space Station. We're doing a lot of experiments out there, amazing amount of science. So you take all the systems of a spacecraft, provide your pressure, give you your oxygen to breathe. You have to scrub out your carbon dioxide. You have to worry about thermal temperature control. All those systems, and you shrink them around a person. Now you want the person to, to stay alive, be safe, and get their work done. And on the right, that is actually a NASA kind of gas pressurized look at some, some future designs. These are big, bulky, gas pressurized suits. You're in a balloon. You're in a balloon, you're alive, that's good. We're applying pressure, but they're not very mobile. It's hard to, they're hard to move against. Um, so I'm a researcher, and uh, we like to flip the design paradigm. So rather than shrinking a spacecraft around a person, what if I said, hey, this is a person, and I like to study athletes and perform, say, what if I can design, I'm an aerospace engineer, what if I can design a suit from, this, from the skin, literally the skin out, a second skin suit? So that means you'd kind of shrink wrap someone. And uh, you saw some of the earlier work on mechanical counter pressure. We still have to provide pressure. It's a pressure suit, and we need a third of an atmosphere. Spacesuits provide about 4.3 pounds per square inch, 30 kilopascals, depending on what units we want to talk about. But it's about a third of an atmosphere. That's what we're. That's the design goal to reach: about a third of an atmosphere. And um, so, in our research. Um, we are going to the moon. I can't wait to get there. Again, it's been 50 years. Let's get on with it. And uh, here's some of the design, and we're going to get on to Mars. We will become interplanetary. We will have people on the Earth and Mars. Uh, Earth is my favorite planet, Mars number two. Uh, and it's round trip. You're going to come home, and you're going to want to see your family. So, uh, But I'd love to think about pushing the technology and the materials for the suit of the future. So to do that, we study astronauts, uh, students. My students grow up, and they become astronauts. And in the lab, we're looking at full mobility. So these are skin strain maps to the millimeter precision level. So everyone gets their own suit. Uh, we won't have that issue with uh, not enough suits for everyone. Um, you get your own suit. It has to be custom designed and built because we have the technology. So why wouldn't we do that? And uh, what you're looking at here, a little bit of the, the mathematics for you. Um, 
These are uh, this kind of circle pattern that I have. If you put circles, infinitesimal circles, all over your skin, and then you moved, you moved freely, that circle would turn elliptical. My blue circle here turning into a green ellipse. Those red lines, that's, there's only two of those. Those are bisecting diameters. And from my circle, as it moves to an ellipse, it pivots. It pivots, it rotates, but it does not extend. These are called the lines of non-extension. And there's some beautiful, elegant mathematics behind that. That's three-dimensional eigenvector analysis. And um, voila, we get a Spider-Man looking suit. But it's the math that drives on that. And why is that important? This lines, these patternings, as I said, they didn't extend, not very much. That's where you put your electronics. That's where you put um, some of your smart sensors. That's how I know how my astronauts are performing. And the orthogonal direction, it stretches a lot. You use materials, passive elastic materials, polymers that stretch a lot. That's where you get your mobility from. Um, in the middle here, we do use some uh, active materials, kind of think of them as fancy zippers, if you will. And um, we use um, shape memory alloys right now. That's a nickel titanium, um, kind of known as muscle wires, kind of cinch it up to get that pressure production we need. Right now we're researching uh, shape memory polymers as well. And just as literally as uh, um, recently as this uh, last couple months, we're looking at, uh, say this fast twice, hydrogenated boron nanotubes, all right? HBNNTs. They're fantastic. I don't know. They look like that. Uh, I work with my material scientist friends, but why is that so exciting? It could be a huge breakthrough for us, thinking about the designs. As a spacesuit designer, I've always said, we don't put the radiation protection in a suit. Why? Because it makes it massive and bulky, so you do that in the rover, you, you live in, under the ground in lava tubes, but I need my, my astronauts light and mobile. Well, guess what? There's some new materials on the drawing board. These boring nanotubes, we're putting them into threads. We're spinning them into threads, if you give me something that has radiation protection and I can put it in a thread, guess what? I can get back to making very lightweight, um, skin-fitting, formal-fitting suits. So that's the, that's the future that we see is uh, mobile, lightweight astronauts, people on Mars exploring, a lot of people on the moon, and a lot of people continuing in low Earth orbit. Again, we will become interplanetary, uh, inspired by uh, this amazing museum. Uh, what an incredible job to get uh, Neil and Buzz and all these suits back for all of us to look at. Uh, Again, so I'm going to keep it short and looking forward to some wonderful Q&A with you all, I think. Thank you for your attention. That's okay. Um, our final slide brings us full circle back to our um, Ignite video and this, this growing, um, not only our spacesuits becoming more diverse, but we as a museum are appealing to a more diverse audience and trying to introduce them not only to the new technologies, but the fact that there are these hidden stories throughout our, our museum that we're going to tell. Um, spacesuits are just not about astronauts. Um, they're about engineers and technicians, material scientists. Um, and the one question, just to start this off for us discussing um, spacesuits and our program tonight, is the role of testing. And that is a, a role that comes up repeatedly. And I, uh, perhaps, Bill, you can start it off as the senior test engineer from ILC Do Dover. What is the role of testing and how important is it in the spacesuit process? Well, uh, it's, uh, it's everything. Um, you know, when they started Apollo out, you have uh, design ideas. Maybe an engineer has an idea of how to make a leg or an arm work. But it, and you can design it, and you can put someone in the suit and pressurize it. Uh, the Apollo suits were 3.75 pounds per square inch. So you had a lot of pressure loads in there. And so you could flex your elbow, and if it flexed great, that, was, that would be fine. And that's what they did. They would get it in. They would certify the suits. Uh, uh, by doing these motions, but maybe halfway through a cable would break or the rubber would fail or something And so they'd have to start over again. And that's just the way it goes I think everybody understands that if you design a car It's the same way you have to take it down a test track and you find out what breaks and you fix it um, 
our president of the company, uh, Homer Reem, uh, I mentioned him earlier, he, he uh, contributes a lot to my understanding of what happened. And, and he was down in Houston when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, and he said, you know, he said, when we were down there, we were scared to death because we knew that the suits were tested as, as, as much as they could be tested in the lab. They, they just uh, would break things and fix it and break it and fix it. And, uh, and so in the lab, as far as mechanically, the suits work fine. Then they put it in a vacuum chamber and they'd make sure it would hold pressure and, and then you could work in it. So they do all these things piecemeal. You did a test here, you did a test there. But, but when he was down there in Houston, when Neil walked down that ladder, he was scared to death because that was the first test. That was the first test of a, of a suit. Um, because you had the full environment that you could never duplicate here on Earth. So uh, testing is just uh, everything. John Young used to get in the suit, and he, I use him as an example because he loved to try to break the suit. And you know, his goal was to break that suit in the lab. He did not want that suit to be broken 250,000 miles from Earth. So what he would do is get in the suit, and he would tear it up. He had this one idea of, of jumping up, and when he, as he came down, he would splay his legs apart so he could maybe get down to, to reach that rock on the surface. Because yeah, those early suits, they didn't have very good mobility. I mean, they were fine, they were given the state of the art. But he figured if he could do that, he might be able to break it. And he sure enough did. He broke a couple cables. So we had to go back, and NASA said, well, uh, go redesign the knee, because it was somewhere down that knee section. So we did uh, redundant knee cables. And we kept, so we kept doing it and doing it over, and NASA was funding it, and you know, it was getting a little crazy. Finally, everybody realized that on the lunar surface, you only had one six G. So his ability to jump and pull the full weight down on it was irrelevant, and it took that long for NASA to realize it. And actually, on the way to the moon on one of the missions, um, uh, we, John McMullen, a friend of mine, was the systems engineer, and called down to Houston and said, to Jim McBaron, hey Jim, we just broke another cable in the suit. And they said, stop, stop testing right away. You're done, stop it. <laughs> because they realized that we, we were overkilling this thing, but um, I could go on all night, so I'm gonna stop there. But you get the idea, testing was everything. Uh, we still do it today. In my lab, my lab, I retired, I turned it over to someone else. But in that lab, there's guys that we hired to cycle test the suit when we to put new materials in it. We have to find suppliers now, because it's getting to be an old suit. And NASA can't fund a new suit design right now, so we're stuck with the suit we have. We put new materials in it from different suppliers. We can't just build suits and parts and send it to NASA. We have to certify all that material. So we're still, to this day, we certify all the materials in the suit to make sure it holds up. So that's my, my short, long answer, my long, <laughs> short answer. I have another question and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, we were constantly at the museum talking about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. But what I would like to ask all of our guests if they have an opinion is what is the role of design and aesthetics to spacesuits? This is especially considering the prospect of sending humans out for long-term um, human space flight, long-term exploration that may take years or more. Um, so wh what do you think the role is of design and aesthetics? I'll take that one first. So uh, first of all, I, I call it, I spent my whole career uh, on STEM education as an aerospace engineer myself, but I call it STEAMed, and I'm very intentional about that. The arts are in, the arts are in, because uh, you, all paint, you all paint the pictures, you tell the stories, you tell the history. I need all the artists to paint the pictures. And um, D for design is critically important because I have a whole new 3D generation of makers out there. Now, if they don't want to be an aerospace engineer, it breaks my heart, but you know, I want to get them to Mars and, and back to the moon. So, uh, and it's really important to, to, to widen the field because I talk to a lot of kids and they say, um, well, STEM education, that's not for me. What do you know? You're five years old. Of course it's for you because they have to see themselves and they have to uh, really have a sense of belonging. So it has to be diverse. It has to be inclusive. And I'll tell you what, we'll raise up STEM if we raise up everyone. And uh, final, final click on that, because I had Katherine Johnson up there, my heroine, 100 years old, the mathematical genius and computer who helped do the, you know, calculate our numbers for the Apollo orbits. She was hidden, but uh, no longer. We're not hidden anymore. And so for all the, the kids out there, uh, or all the parents who want to go back to school, you don't have to be the best in math and physics and chemistry. How intimidating is that? That's uh, how I was taught as an engineer. You weed people out. Well, that's the wrong message. I'm here to say, those are tools. I use them every day. But you know, what's your passion? You know, is it getting people to the moon, Mars? Is it helping with climate change? All these things. And then surely, as an educator, we'll, we'll lift everyone up. So I'm working on changing the message to steamed and a, a, little, bit, a little bit more. But I, I feel 
Thank you for the questions. We need um, everyone. We just have a few minutes. Do we have questions from the audience? Um, Just to repeat that for the entire audience to hear. With the initial spacesuit design, what was the biggest showstopper? What stumped you most about making these spacesuits? It um. was mobility. Mobility and fit and comfort. Those were the biggest things. You could put reliability in there. I could probably go on. In order, though, the mobility, because we won the contest because our suit was a little more mobile than the others. It wasn't a whole lot mo more mobile. But, but you know, if you read the evaluation process that came out of it on those early Apollo suits, the, the feedback was it has more mobility. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Um, the gentleman right How much does a space suit cost? How much does a space suit cost? Well, you know, today, I, I, it's hard to put a, I say million dollars. It's hard to say because we don't build a suit anymore. We build parts of suits. So today, you know, we might have a, a pair of arms go out the door or a pair of boots. Uh, now the backpack, the primary life support system built by Hamilton, I don't know, I've heard 10 million. Um, yeah, but yeah, we say about 10 million. The most expensive part is the primary life support yeah. system. Well, again, it, it takes various times. Like a pair of gloves might take three months. So uh, two years ago, um, uh, general inspector of NASA announced the price for uh, EMU, the $250 million. That includes all the, the yes. design. IBA space suit costs uh, a few hundred thousand. A few hundred thousand. Few hundred thousand. I'm with Nikolai. Thousand. Order of magnitude reduction. <laughs> I, I, I just want to get to the yeah. next lady in the center. And then. I'm just curious, you know, when you look at the things that they look like cloth, I'm just really amazed by the actual fabric that they use. The layers are actually in these you know, vacuum out. Um, the question was, when you look at a space suit, it just looks like cloth. And the question is, how many layers? Um, I just want to put a plug in for everyone. Come on July 16th. You will see Neil Armstrong's suit that has been digitized, preserved. And we've got a new high-tech case. And we will have available images of the um, x-rays that we have done on the suit. And you'll be able to see what a magnificent machine it is. It is not work clothes. So that's my own personal plug. <laughs> but um, if you can go on and talk about layers and, and yeah, composition. Uh, I'll, I'll take it first. So uh, depending, 14, uh, depending on how you count. So first you get your astronaut long underwear, it's stretchy, and then you, in the current, you know, in the gas pressure suit, then Tygon tubing to heat you up or cool you down, that's thermal control. And then you start going through the, the layers of the suit. It's a bladder, so you need a bladder layer, then we have a second bladder layer, and then there's something called a liner, and you keep adding those up, and then there's five layers of kind of fancy aluminized mylar, that, then you get into the thermal properties of the suit. They all look white, because uh, that's the outer layer, that's the thermal micrometeorite garment, uh, literally, for, you know, to, and it's mostly white uh, for design reasons. So the current, th this suits that you're looking at, Many, many multiple layers. It's probably about 21 in the Apollo suit. Yeah, 14 to 21 is there. But we're going to make them a lot less in the future. So you can be more mobile. <laughs> Did you have a, com a comment, Nick? Um, no. um, the gentleman in the blue shirt, I think he's. <coughs> the Yes. <laughs> I don't know if you all heard we, that. We worried about, uh, yeah, if you want to repeat that. There were zippers in the Apollo suit. There was a double pressure zipper. And the question was, did we worry, did we worry about dirt getting into the seal? Well, there were a number of concerns with the zippers. Number one, after Apollo was over, they, you know, we all decided, NASA and everybody decided, no more zippers in suits. Uh, the zippers worked. Uh, if you, you flex them enough, and if in training suits, they failed. And we had to re we replaced. I think I, I have it. In, I'm doing a book called uh, um, uh, Lunar Outfitters, and it's I got a publisher. But in the book, I, so I'm plugging my book, in, and it's not out yet. But um, <laughs> but in there, I talk about Neil's suit, and in Neil's suit, I think in his suit, I I, I think three times we replaced his zipper before his prime suit before it even flew. But the zippers uh, were failure mode. Uh, they, they worked fine on the missions. But uh, to your point, there was always concern about dirt getting in and clogging it up. And it did in the later missions where on like Apollo 17, they did three EVAs. And they were constantly opening, closing zippers. That lunar dust got to be a real issue. 
Um, we're all familiar with that. Uh, if you go back to the moon and go to Mars, we have to engineer a suit better so that not only the, the zippers but the disconnects stay clean somehow. Yes, the lady, young lady in the blue shirt. The question was about the spacesuits for Mars and what sort of time restraints would they be have on them for EVA use? Uh, good question. Some of the, so uh, first it's about a three and a half year uh, mission uh, to Mars, so it's not for the faint of heart. It would take about eight months to get there and about a year and a half to get home and hopefully we're going there to search for the evidence of life, past life, so we need to be on the surface 500, 600 days. Uh, the EVAs, we call them sorties or spacewalks. Uh, typically now you think about eight hours. I actually like the notion of thinking about four hours in the morning, come in, you know, eat some lunch and four hours, and it's gonna be humans on our rovers and you know, all of our equipment. Now, we don't have much on Mars today, but so think about it that, but, but a long, you know, again, a long work day. They're gonna have to work for many, many repetitions, right? The first Mars mission was say four people. It's gonna be over a thousand EVA spacewalks. In human history, all of human history in the last 50 years, US, Russia, all of them, we've done uh, just over 550 spacewalks to date. So we'll break that on the first Mars mission. So um, I would love to add uh, some comments about Martian uh, space design. So that is a real challenge for engineers and designers. So uh, um, gravity, uh, dust, um, atmosphere, low density, but it has atmosphere, and some uh, life support systems, devices will not work on that. Uh, and um, the most critical issue for the spacesuit, so EMU has weighed 250 pounds, new NASA spacesuit has 300 pounds weight. So we have to consider much less weight. So weight, low, low weight, Spacesuit is the most critical issue. So, yes, the, the young lady all the way up top with the long hair. Yes, you. <laughs> <coughs> The question was, when did they start um, making accounting for gender diversity um, in making spacesuits, in manufacturing spacesuits? Well, uh, I'll just say that in, in our current uh, EMU, our current suit, uh, we looked at the hard upper torso shell. That's a limiting factor, I think, in a lot of uh, cases because uh, it has a, the, the side bearing, the openings up top here, kind of can restrict your reach out front. And so we have like a medium large and extra large size uh, hard upper torso. And we found that the smaller female astronauts couldn't quite, uh, we couldn't size them properly in that suit. So, uh, you know, I think the next generation suit, we have to look at that. And that's why I say art, the way we're looking at it, I know these folks down here have some comments on that too, what they're looking at in their designs. But you have to accommodate for that. I think one of the, the tougher areas to design a suit uh, for the, uh, is a shoulder assembly. If you think about the way a body moves, it's flex extension, adduction, abduction, rotation. All these things have to happen, and the upper torso takes a, a beating in that, so you have to design that so you have that mobility and sizing uh, across the shoulders, is, is my input. Yeah. Uh, yes. Every, everyone should get their own suit. I mean, we have the technology. <coughs> everyone should get a custom suit, uh, and so it can be for everyone, but, but again, that's my. Take on. We, can, we have the, you know, everyone gets a custom suit because you'll perform much better in it, so it needs to fit you. Yes? Um, is what we kind of talk about the uh, research and development uh, behind two points, uh, more significant these days? And I know it has PRL as well. Is that as well experience? Um, what work do you feel still needs to be done on those types of suits? And when do you think those will be at the um, The question was about the Z, Z series of suits that they're working on down at NASA JSC and you lost me with the TRL, but what, <laughs> um, what needs to be done with suit, that suit further for, in terms of testing and, and refinement yeah. before it can be used? Yeah. Okay. I can probably <laughs> take that one. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the, and the question was about suit ports. So um, that's a kind of a different concept, an interesting concept. So imagine if uh, 
Uh, you got into your suit, and uh, but again, through a big back hatch. Imagine a big back hatch on your suit. So you'd get in, it's easy to dress, and then you'd close that up. You can take those suits and like hang them off the rover. So it has some advantages that uh, kind of the suits go with the rover together. So it's, that's like, although the disadvantage to a support is it's very massive, it's very heavy. So there's pros and cons to what's known as a, as a suit port. Um, since we haven't talked too much, but when you get into a space suit, that's a low pressure, it's a third of an atmosphere, and you have to make sure you don't decompress or get the bends. And so this all goes in with um, the pressurization of the suit, and if you jump in through a suit port, that the gentleman mentioned a, something called a technology readiness level of seven, which is a, is a pretty highly, it, it, means, it means we have a lot of technology, we have suit ports, we're kind of ready to go. It, um, so it's been researched, it's been developed, it, uh, it's not uh, really baselined in any mission that I know of now, and it probably because you pay the mass penalty. But interesting, you know, engineering solution. There's a gentleman all the way up in the last row, or next to last row, yes. Um, the, the question was about Scott Kelly's experience, and he said that his, his eyeglasses prescription were ground into the helmet. And is that normal? Is that you, or was that a one-time? I have to say I'm not familiar with that. I, I'd never heard of that. I didn't know because that would be, it'd be a lot of work to try to get a helmet customized for an astronaut. They do wear glasses. They wear corrective lens, but that's all I'm aware of. So you lost me on that one. I'm not sure. It could be right, but I don't know. Uh, we've got time for one or two more questions. The gentleman in the red shirt. I have a question for Ryan. In all of the research that you've done to try to reproduce the accuracy, what did you come across that you were surprised by? And why did they do it this way? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this qu question was for Ryan about all the, the research he's done to recreate the suits. Did he come up to any point where he was just puzzled by? why the engineers made it this way, in one particular way? Uh, usually it's the opposite. I, I, I would wonder why, just looking at something, why it was done that way, but in the process of recreating that, I, I, would, uh, I would understand. I would, it's, it's kind of interesting because you're, you're retracing the steps of what the engineers did, and I don't think there's even a lot of record of these things. Like, I noticed on the, the between the A7L and the A7LB, there's a diverter valve knob that uh, controls the amount of air that they would pump into the helmets. And I noticed on the B suits that these cutouts on the on the knob were much deeper. And uh, I, something I just always noticed looking at them in museums, but then I realized, oh, with with gloved hands, you could grab that knob better. So at some point, some astronaut must have said, I can't turn this knob. So I, I, I see stuff like that all the time. And, and I'll just add that when, when Ryan would be working on a project, he'll call me and say, this piece of hardware has this or that to it. I have to stop and look at the detail because it, it's just over my head. I look at it and go, my God, you're looking at that kind of, kind of detail. <laughs> and it, asks, it, it begs the question of me, too, of, you know, why we did that. So it's, uh, yeah, the design is interesting. Um, one last question, and I'm going to have to give it to a ringer, Valerie. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. Another question for Ryan. With all of his research, does he have his own vision of what the next suit should look like? I was going to, when you were mentioning aesthetics, I kind of thought that's, I don't make real space suits. I make costumes. So that's kind of all I deal with. Um, but I do notice this funny thing with uh, space suit design is that the first suits are always designed kind of in the way that they think they should be, like with science fiction. Like the, the X-15 suit and the Mercury suit, they were silver. Uh, and they really didn't have to be silver, but they, I, I think the, the, the legend is that Scott Crossfield saw that silver fabric on a table at the David Clark Company and said, oh, that looks really cool. That should be, you know, for, for <laughs> PR, that should be what a suit should look like. But over the course of Gemini and Apollo, they got rid of that. They said, this is silly. We don't, we don't need that. And I noticed, um, too, with like the Martian, the suit looks a lot like Deva Newman's suit. And so the, like, the first things are kind of what they think they should be, but the, I know it'll evolve into what 
you know, functionally it needs to be. And so I, that's kind of the exciting thing, I think, is just seeing what naturally develops. I, I don't know. <clears throat> Um, I would just like to thank our, our panelists for an all too short program. People who know me, we could be here for hours, but unfortunately we, um, the house says we cannot. Um, but please join me in thanking our, our guests. Yeah. Um, I do have a safety announcement um, for, for safety reasons and for turning over the theater space. We ask you all to exit upstairs through the doors upstairs. If you want to continue this conversation, you'll be able to meet our speakers downstairs in the lobby um, after this. Um, once again, I would like to thank the Boeing Corporation and the Raytheon um, Company for their contributions to the museums activities for the Apollo 50th anniversary. And for any of you who are sticking around, just wanted to let you know, at 9.45, Spider-Man Far From Home will be playing here in this theater. So um, if you want to go back down and get tickets. But please, and thank you all. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of your questions, but this is a very good program. <laughs> good night. <laughs>